that I said I was going to talk about, I'll begin by talking about this subject, Wick Rotation. Um, so remember, I introduced the kind of axiom system where <coughs> a d-dimensional field theory at least roughly speaking, assigned to each d minus one dimensional compact oriented Riemannian manifold a vector space. And <coughs> to a cobordism, I think I'll write cobordisms like this. So W is a cobordism from M0 to M1. <coughs> that goes to a linear map. <coughs> and <coughs> in the case where this was Riemannian, <coughs> I said this should be a trace class operator. <coughs> For the moment, just think that it's some very contracting operator. It's quite the opposite to an invertible operator. It's, it, it, it's continuous and it makes everything very small. It's certainly compact. It takes an open, a neighborhood of the origin in here to a compact subset in there. Well, <coughs> on the other hand, I said that in order to get towards real physics, we have to <coughs> enlarge this situation to allow W to be equipped with a complex Riemannian metric belonging to a certain domain. And I'd like to tell you a little bit about that domain. And I'll start off in the case of d equals 2, because that's the only case, I might have to confess, where <coughs> I've really thought this through very carefully, and I feel pretty confident about what I'm talking about. In higher dimensions, I'm afraid I'll be sort of essentially speculating. Well, <coughs> the, the first thing to say is in any dimension, when you're studying Riemannian manifolds, it is very often a good idea to keep separate the conformal structure defined by the metric and the volume form. Uh, one of the striking places where you see that, of course, is in the recent work of Perelman on the, um, uh, on the Poincaré conjecture. Uh, but if we were, for instance, talking about, um, for example, the quantum theory of a field, phi, <coughs> on a, a space-time manifold, Suppose it was real valued, but what I'm about to say makes equally good sense if it were a sigma model with value in anything else. You see, <coughs> what we, uh, we want to write down an action for this, and I explained to you last time that the natural action to take is <coughs> uh, possibly plus a mass term, if we want, but anyway, let's focus on this term, which would make sense with any target. If, if this were going into some other Riemannian manifold, we'd just put the inner product of those two, one, uh, those two forms. If we want to write this out in more coordinates, like way, we would write this as, in terms of local coordinates, I suppose people who do this professionally write the coordinates like that. <coughs> and then you'd have to write the inverse of the Riemannian metric and then you'd have to, in order to integrate, you'd have to write the volume element like that. So this is the volume element defined by the Riemannian metric. Well, in particular, when d equals 2, you see this is the inverse of the 2 by 2 matrix defining the Riemannian metric. And this is the square root of the determinant. So if you were to multiply at each point uh, the metric by a constant, that dependency would cancel out, and this would only depend on the conformal class. But even when that's not true, somehow the conformal, <coughs> the, if you scale this by the appropriate power of the square root of the determinant to make it conformally invariant, then you should consider that and the volume element separately. That seems to be the general drift. So what I'm actually going to talk about is a domain in the <coughs> space of complex conformal 
structures. In other words, I'm going to consider complex Riemannian metrics, so things given locally by Gij, an invertible 2 by 2 symmetric matrix, which is complex valued, but modulo multiplying by scalar. Well, of course, <coughs> such a quadratic form on a two-dimensional real vector space, the tangent space, it will have two null lines, the two light lines, which if this is a Riemann, so you, you can think of them as, <coughs> if we look in the <coughs> projective space, <coughs> of um, the complexified tangent space at a point. So this will be a two dimension, d equals two. This will be x is a point of w. And this is a two-dimensional complex space. So this is just a Riemann sphere, a complex projective line. There'll be two points in here, which are the two light directions. And if this were a real Riemannian metric, an honest Riemannian metric, they would be complex conjugate points, one in the upper hemisphere and the other in the lower hemisphere, separated by the real axis. They wouldn't be on the real axis. They would uh, be separated by it. And <coughs> on the other hand, if we had a uh, Lorentzian metric, which was real, these two points would be the two real light directions. They would then be two points on the equator here. So if you think of this... Riemann sphere like this, with this equatorial line being the real directions in the tangent space, then a real metric corresponds to, a real Riemannian metric corresponds to a pair of points like that, and a Lorentzian metric corresponds to a pair of points on the axis. So <coughs> I want to consider the domain of these things where we allow any complex thing where we insist that the two points are separated and not on the real axis and are separated by the equatorial uh, real circle. So <coughs> you say you should think of this as being a picture somehow <coughs> like the upper half plane, which would be the case d equals 1, where we will have <coughs> honest real Riemannian metrics going along a kind of imaginary axis. That will be the point where, the, the cases where these points are complex conjugate. Uh, a domain out here where we have a pair of complex points, one in each hemisphere, and a boundary <coughs> where, we, where the two points go to distinct points on the equator. Well, <coughs> so... Uh, this is what, uh, if you think about it, th this means at each point we have this, um, this domain and the real points are what you call a Shilov boundary of it. You see it's got two complex dimensions. It, in, in fact, it's a product of two copies of the unit disk in the complex numbers. Uh, I'm a little puzzled, but if I consider a family of points which are complex conjugate, then the limit is, as they approach the real axis, don't they land on the same they do indeed, and that would that would be a, that wouldn't be that would be a degenerate metric. Right. Yeah. yeah. So we don't we don't want to allow that. Okay. But I will come to that okay. presently. Okay. Um, <coughs> so uh, th this these Lorentzian things are a Shilov boundary. Right? We so it's like the sense in which S one cross S one is what's called the Shilov boundary of D2 cross D2. This is a two-dimensional complex domain, and this is a compact subset of its boundary, which has the property that, uh, first of all, bounded complex holomorphic functions there always attain their maximum on a point of this. And that means, of course, that a holomorphic function here is completely determined by its uh, boundary value just on this half-dimensional part of the topological boundary. Well, <coughs> the domain of metrics we want, because this is what happens at just one point, uh, we want to uh, have a cross-section of this bundle, so we'll have some infinite dimensional domain where this is happening at each point. Yeah? I'm not clear on whether you're allowing the points on the real axis. The points, if, if the points are on the real axis, they have to be distinct. I want this definitely... So it's not the whole Sheilov boundary. Sorry? Yeah, so it's not the whole Sheilov boundary, no. Yeah. No, I, 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 I'm, I'm going to come to that. 
uh, <coughs> of course, in infinite dimensions, it's not too clear what a Shilov boundary means. It's a somewhat uh, notional thing, but I, I'm going to come back to it. So let's just think what this means uh, <coughs> globally. I, if you have your cobordism, uh, <coughs> then uh, we have these two complex lines that you can think of them as two complex structures on, on this thing, which if we're in this complex conjugate region are just the, the, the two orientations of the same complex structure, the complex structure and its complex conjugate. If you think of the point locally, if you think of things as d described at a point by the zeta in the upper half plane and we take local coordinates x and y, then a holomorphic function for the complex structure zeta is one which would be annihilated by, I dare say, 1 over zeta d by dy. And <coughs> you see, for instance, if zeta is i, that's an ordinary holomorphic function of when you write z as x plus i, y. Uh, but as this comes to the boundary, this becomes a real differential operator, and the complex structure degenerates to a foliation uh, corresponding to wherever this point hits the axis, and the holomorphic functions become functions which are constant along the system of light lines defined by this. So, uh, so what happens on the boundary? We, so we have this domain where a point of the domain is a pair of holomorphic structures, opposite orientation. Uh, which might or might not be complex conjugates of each other. And on the boundary of the domain of these things, we have the Lorentzian metrics. Well, the first thing to say is you certainly aren't going to have any Lorentzian metrics at all unless the Euler number of this cobordism is zero. For example, uh, if, you, if the cobordism is a pair of pants, uh, you certainly can't find any Lorentzian metric on it. So we're not going to have any points in that Shilov boundary anyway. One of the things I've heard more often than I like from string theorists is they always tell you the reason why string theory solves the problem of divergences coming from things coinciding at a point is because when two strings come together like a pair of pants, there's no point of which they intersect. Well, there's <laughs> if you try to do it with Lorentzian signature, of course, there precisely does have to be a point singularity. So that's not a very convincing argument, but it's repeated very often. Anyway, supposing we have a cobordism which is, for example, like a cylinder, has Euler number zero, then on the boundary we have these <coughs> left and right moving light lines going through every point. And um, I used to always to say, rather simple-mindedly, that this gave you a diffeomorphism from the incoming circle to the outgoing circle, because if you start at a point here and you follow mm -hmm. the left-going light ray, it will go round and round and it will eventually impact somewhere there. And that will give you, if this is a circle and this is a circle, that would give you a diffeomorphism from one end to the other. And similarly, you could follow the right-going uh, <coughs> light ray and that would give you another diffeomorphism. And <coughs> the, you might think that the, well, in fact, it's easy to see that the real Lorentzian conformal structure determined by that situation is essentially completely determined by these two diffeomorphisms. In other words, the structure gives you two diffeomorphisms of the circle orientation preserving uh, and that essentially determines the structure not quite you actually get a z-fold covering group of this because you can see in order to reconstruct the surface from the two diffeomorphisms you need to know an integer the number of times the lines have gone round before they get to the far end so you actually get a covering space of this but no matter however um, that is not of course true uh, it, it, you might of course not get to the other end at all you might find that this line winds round <coughs> and becomes closer and closer to some light line that simply goes round and cuts the annulus 
in two, so the lines come round getting closer and closer to that, and then the, the light lines going the other way just go across, just as you might expect. So there's nothing in the least singular about that Lorentzian structure, but it doesn't correspond to anything which goes uh, nicely from one end to the other. So, <coughs> you see, you might think that this domain had this on its boundary, but <coughs> it certainly doesn't just have that because it has these things where the Romanian structure does strange things in the interior. You can think of this as like a kind of black hole. You, you see, the light gets trapped and it doesn't come out of the end. So it's some kind of, I don't know what it, in this situation a black hole would mean, but it, it's that typical kind of behavior of the global structure of the Lorentzian manifold going wrong. Well, um, I, so we, the Shilov boundary certainly contains more than just this, if it contains anything at all, but of course for a general surface it isn't going to contain anything at all because the thing will be forced to be degenerate, will be forced to have, in other words, points where the mm. two directions on the circle, the two light directions would come together. Uh, but before I um, pursue that any further, let me just mention what happens in higher dimensions. Uh, the, the other case I've thought of particularly is, is the case of four dimensions, of course. That's the one that people usually think about when they're doing relativity. Uh, it's the, um, the picture is actually very similar. You see, <coughs> if you have a complex non-degenerate quadratic form on a real four-dimensional vector space, uh, what does it do? It defines for you not a pair of points, but a complex quadric in the uh, proje complex projective three space. This, this, instead of being P1 when uh, D was 2, it will be P3 when D equals 4. And um, of course, well, in another way of saying it is if you have a four-dimensional complex vector space, <coughs> to give a non-degenerate complex valued quadratic form on it is exactly the same as to write it as the tensor product of two two-dimensional complex vector spaces. Of course, if you then projectivize, uh, this is just a complex quadric. The image of that is the complex quadric. And if you, <coughs> so you think of that as like these two points. See, that's a complex quadric in uh, Invention in one dimensional projective space. Uh, in general, you think of this as like some kind of complex hyperboloid or something. When you take out a non degenerate complex quadric, the space you're left with has the homotopy type of real projective three space. Just as the complement of, if you take out those two points, the thing retracts onto the equator, which is uh, real projective one space. Uh, if you, in general, it retracts onto real projective three space. And the domain we want to look at. Uh, in four dimensions is the um, exactly the situation where you have this complex quadric which doesn't meet the real axis but where the uh, real three space so, so to speak goes up the middle of it <laughs> you see what I mean sitting inside that uh, region and on the boundary you get the situation where it becomes a real quadric these two points and it, you, it would, you would have, to, and you would have to pick the pick. I mean, you, you have to analyze the situation quite carefully. The different ways a complex quadric can sit with respect to the real three space, but you have to look at the domain where, on the boundary, you get the thing where you get a a real uh, quadric that looks like a uh, uh, look, looks like the projectivized light cone. Looks like a sphere, a true sphere. Uh, right. Now, um, I was going to try and say a little bit more about that, but I think I'll go back to this situation. Uh, because I want to discuss this question of uh, what happened. You, you see, supposing, suppose you believe that this is a good picture. The general belief then is that the theory is going to be defined for metrics equipped with a complex metric in this domain, this linear map is going to depend holomorphically on the metric. Uh, 
on the complex metric. And uh, therefore, everything will be determined by what it does on the actual Riemannian metrics. Although, of course, there will be a condition that you will be able to extend it. I mean, just the same way as if you give a real valued function here, uh, it may or may not extend to something holomorphic in the upper half plane, which we can then look at the boundary values of along there. But if it does, uh, everything is determined by what goes here. So the fact that we have this thing which extends holomorphically uh, to something with these Lorentzian things on its boundary, that's our fundamental assumption which is meant to encode the positivity of energy in quantum field theory. So I'd like to just point out one feature of it, because one, I ought to tell you in general what we mean by saying a theory is unitary. So I'll say a few words about unitarity and then come back to this example. Uh, this, is, this is in general, but I'll be mainly interested in the two-dimensional case. Um, <coughs> well, uh, now, remember, I already pointed out that when we had this d minus one-dimensional manifold, we associated to that a vector space, but I already pointed out that it didn't really just depend on m, it depended on an infinitesimal germ of something d-dimensional along m. So, for example, this might have been something that was getting bigger or getting smaller. It might have, you should think of it as perhaps looking like a cone up this way, or maybe a cone, so to speak, up that way, with a direction of time going through it. So, <coughs> we really have this germ, and it's a germ of an oriented manifold with a kind of arrow of time. So these things come in fours, not in twos. We could not only change the orientation, but we could reverse the direction of time. So we should just think of the formal properties of that with respect to being a field theory. You see, uh, suppose you had... Suppose this is our germ. So it's something that's kind of getting bigger as time goes on. Then uh, let's think of this little bit of manifold between something just a tiny bit earlier time and a tiny bit later time. Uh, if we think of these as both incoming boundaries, so I'll think of this as being the original one and this with its arrow of time reversed but nothing else reversed as being the top one, then <coughs> what this, you see, will give you is a cobordism from the disjoint union of m union m star to the empty set, and hence it will give you a pairing like that. And <coughs> it takes some discussion because I haven't... It, I'm, in the next lecture, I'm going to say something about what kind of topological vector spaces and what sense of duality and all sorts of things. But this argument, which is very familiar to people who've thought about quantum field theory in this perspective, uh, is usually expressed by saying that when you change the orientation in the sense of reversing the arrow of time, then this becomes isomorphic to the vector space dual <coughs> of the space you had before. So reversing the orientation in the sense of reversing the time direction or the transversal direction, that corresponds to duality in the vector space sense. So nothing to do with complex antilinearity or anything like that. On the other hand, uh, for a lot, of, a lot of theories are what are called unitary. And unitarity is meant to say the follow the, something different. Suppose M bar is, uh, see, wh what's the other way we can reverse orientation here? Supposing we uh, keep the same arrow of time, but regard it as a manifold oriented the other way. <coughs> Let's call that... I'll just call that M bar. I, I, it'll take too many words to write it down. Right, so the, the picture, though, is clear. If it's something that's getting bigger, it's still getting bigger, 
but we've reversed its orientation in the space sense. We'll call that M bar. Then a unitary theory, <coughs> so unitarity is meant to be is meant to be the property that what that does is say that this is canonically the complex conjugate vector space of that. So if you put uh, so this is something which we'll automatically have always for uh, any theory. So if you put these two things together, you'll see that <coughs> precisely in the case where these two ways of reversing are the same, so <coughs> if this uh, is equal to that, then we expect the complex conjugate to be the dual vector space, and we should then also put in a condition of positivity, and then we will have uh, at least a pre-Hilbert space structure on this space. Well, what does it mean to say that this is isomorphic to M bar? <coughs> you see, that's saying that there's a reflection, uh, that the that thing doesn't look like one of these things that's getting bigger or smaller, but that there's a reflection of the germ across its um, midsection, so to speak, which reverses going forwards and going backwards. Uh, and it, that's, the condi that's the situation in which you expect um, the thing to have an inner product, making the vector space associated to the manifold into at least a pre-Hilbert space. Now, what about the operators? Uh, well, uh, again, there's something that's true automatically just from the formalism, just from the axioms, that you see, if you have <coughs> a cobordism from M0 to M1, uh, <coughs> you can reverse its orientation and think of it as a cobordism from this to this. So it's always true that if we take UW, then it's vector space, I'll, I'll, write, trans, I'll write it like that. That means the vector space transpose. I'm sure there's no really good way of, and so no complex conjugation involved. This will be something which goes from H of M1 star so this is u of w star <coughs> which remember is h of m1 dual so that's just the algebraic transpose and that's automatically true from the axioms it's just just put a little u shape on there and see that you can push it round the corner <laughs> so is, star means reversal of the whole uh, uh, no star means reversing orientation in the arrow of time sense and in the cobordism means thinking of it as a cobordism from its end to its beginning rather than its beginning to its end. Uh, well, I'm mainly thinking of things rotated into, you, you see, in general, this wouldn't, it's a bit misleading to call it time because I'm definitely not assuming it has a Lorentzian structure, but you, you might call it that, I suppose. Uh, certainly we're reversing the end, so it's going in the opposite direction. So if it were Lorentzian, it would be going in the, op yes, it would be time reversal. If it's not Lorentzian, Well, well, I mean, if you have a cobordism from something to something, then you can turn it around <laughs> and think of it as a cobordism. I mean, what you decide is the incoming end and the outgoing end is, is a matter of opinion, and, well, opinion being which way you point the arrow of time, you see, and that, that is what I was explaining, that changing the arrow of time, which this was, is just changing the, what you call the beginning and the end of the cobordism. So th there's nothing sort of in that, it's just sort of conventions. Whereas there is something in the unitarity thing. That's a fact about the theory. Uh, and 
so that will tell us that we can do something different. We can change orientation and put a bar everywhere, and then the cobordism will still go the same way. And the axiom that we want is that, so the unitarity axiom is that if we, that if we do this, this, so this is now the permission adjoint. Well, sorry. <laughs> I'll put this and we'll put a bar. This will be a map from H M1 bar star to H M0 bar star. So remember, if these were things which had a time reversal so that they were Hilbert spaces, this would be back to the original space again. <coughs> this should be uh, yeah, this should be the thing associated to U of W bar regarded as a curve. <laughs> uh, let, let me try and how can I I, I find this myself actually exceedingly confusing. It, 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 I mean, there's nothing non-trivial about it, but it's just extremely difficult to n not, not get muddled, I'm afraid. So l let me try and explain what actually is happening. Right. Uh, in one dimension. You see, suppose we have... Hmm? Is that W bar star? Uh, I dare say yes. Uh, I mean, we're just in this situation. Try, think of the one. Hmm? Same orientation as W, just not so different. Well, look, uh, it, it's really better not to spend too long. Let, let me just sort of point, say what I'm trying to tell you. That we're just saying something very simple about semigroups. Supposing you have a self-adjoint operator H, and you're interested in the unitary group T, generated time trans parameterized by T, where you think of T as running along this axis. So you think of that as Lorentzian time, honest physical time. And we are talking about things where T is allowed to go there. And then this will be, if this is a positive self-adjoint operator, like the Hamiltonian of a physical system, this will be a contraction operator. And this axiom that I'm telling you is that expressing the hermissionness of this generator by saying that E to the I T H, where T is in the upper half plane star, is equal to uh, E to the, well, minus I, well, perhaps I'll write it as I minus T bar H. Right, so we're saying that T going to minus T bar is a map from this to itself, which uh, <coughs> corresponds to taking the Hermitian adjoint of the operator. So this is a map in the upper half plane. And so the things on this, the real uh, ones would correspond to something Hermitian, Hermitian contraction operator. Now, let's uh, think about the implications of that in this situation. Let's go back to the two-dimensional story. Uh, you see, one would tend to say that if you have this condition, it will imply that on the boundary, uh, just as just if, you have, if this condition is true for T in the upper half plane, then, of course, it will tell you that on the boundary, the operator is unitary, because we know that on the real axis, uh, reversing T simply changes the element to its inverse. So we're saying that on the boundary, the Hermitian adjoint is the inverse, and therefore the operator is unitary. Now, I want to point out that in this situation with a non-compact Shilov boundary, the situation is a bit different, and it seems to me that's possibly worth thinking about. I, I don't myself have anything deep to say about it, but I'd like to tell you the one case where we really know what happens, <coughs> uh, where we consider 
you see, supposing we consider, just take this picture, but where we have a pair of complex structures. So we, in a two-dimensional theory, by assumption, when we give these pair of balanced, so to speak, complex structures, we expect to get a contracting operator on our vector space. Well, supposing we just look at one half of it. So we can think of a holomorphic, an annulus with a holomorphic structure, a cylinder with a holomorphic structure. Well, I prefer, I prefer to write it as an annulus. You can assume that it's an annulus inside the ordinary complex plane, where this is maybe the incoming and that's the outgoing thing, and it's an annulus like that. So such things form a semigroup. And um, you see, you can see very clearly the, the general shape of it. We have the semigroup is completely determined. The element of the semi, if this is the standard, we can assume that this is a standard unit circle, and then this will be some parametrized curve inside the unit circle. So that's the interior of the semigroup. The Shilov boundary will be when this circle expands, when the annulus becomes thinner and thinner. So it becomes another way of reparametrizing the circle, and that will be the element of difference one, which we had before. When the annulus becomes completely thin, it becomes the diffeomorphism of the circle. And that's, you see, the complex structure was something in here. When we got to the boundary, it becomes the diffeomorphism. Then it's invertible. And uh, when, we read, when we read it the other way <coughs> up, when it's a diffeomorphism, you see, if it's a very thin annulus, so that these things, it's essentially giving you a diffeomorphism between one side and the other, then reading it from the other end is simply doing the inverse diffeomorphism. Okay, well, there's a case where we understand this very well, and we can see what happens. And you'll see that it's what a general relativity theorist, I suppose, would call the mini superspace version. Let's consider inside the semigroup of all these annuli the ones which, where this is a, a standard circle, not necessarily concentric. In other words, we'll consider inside the, all the holomorphic cobordisms of that topological type, we'll consider the thing which I call PSL2 less than zero. This means all the elements <coughs> in PSL, all the Mobius transformations, such that they take the unit disk into the interior of the unit disk. So that's a sub-semigroup of the infinite dimensional semigroup we had before. Now, again, uh, this, well, now this, this, of course, has three complex dimensions, and it really does have a shoot-off boundary now. It really is a domain. Uh, and <coughs> so what, what, what happens? Well, on the boundary, of course, we want to get PSL2R, which, of course, is contained in diff S1. <coughs> That's when the, this thing swells up and covers the whole disk, so that the disk is mapped to the whole disk. Uh, but what is the whole Shilov boundary? It isn't... Uh, well, PSL2R is, of course, a solid torus. It's the interior, you can think of it, it's got fundamental group Z, it looks like a solid torus. And on its boundary is a product of two circles. Really, you should think of it as a product of two real projective lines. And the, uh, what do those points correspond to, those points on the boundary? They correspond to degenerate elements of PSL2R, which are maps from R2 to R2, which are only of rank one. You see, we're looking at the non-zero, if you have a two by two real matrix that's non-zero, it either has rank two, in which case it's in here, or it has rank one. If it's in rank one, it projects onto one line along another line. And those two lines are two points in the real projective space. So they're something in circle cross circle, and that's the circle on the boundary of this. You might prefer to, this group, of course, has two connected components according to the si sign of the determinant. And more algebraically, you might like to think of a picture in real projective three space where this torus is a real 
hyperboloid of one sheet which divides uh, the projective space into these two uh, regions uh, which are two copies of the group the one or two well the component with determinant positive and the component with determinant negative anyway now let's uh, go back to how this manifests how this manifests itself um, You see, among other things, what, um, when, when we have the two-dimensional field theory, it's got to give us a space associated to the circle, which when we have two of these complex cylinders, is going to give us a map <coughs> like this. Well, uh, I'll just, just to simplify the explanation, just suppose it's what you call a chiral theory, so the thing only depends on one of them. So we'll just suppose we have an action of this semi-group of complex annuli. Well, in particular, we have the subgroup of it consisting of this. So we have an action, we automatically have an action of PSL2 by contraction operators. Sorry? Uh, well, well you, it's probably simplest to think of it that way because what we've taken a circle and we're holding that fixed and we're considering cobordisms at the moment from that to itself. So I've identified the two boundary circles with a definite circle. I'm not allowed to sort of change that in the course of the discussion. So best to think of parametrized, I think. Uh, so we have this action by contraction operators and it's meant to be holomorphic, we said. And it's meant we want it to continue analytically to these things on the boundary so as to get a unitary representation of PSL2R. Well, of course, we know all about the representations, the unitary representations of PSL2R. Roughly speaking, there are two kinds. There are ones which do have this property of uh, being, well, there are the discrete series and the principal series and some exceptions. Uh, this means that the representations of PSL2R, which we can... Uh, get are precisely the principal, the, the, the discrete series representations the one and they very obviously do extend to an action of this because a typical discrete series representation would be something like the holomorphic uh, forms of a certain degree on the disk uh, PSL2R is a group of holomorphic automorphisms of that so it twists those things around but on the other hand, if you map the disk inside itself, then clearly you could pull back holomorphic functions by that. And that would give you a contraction operator because restricting a holomorphic function to a subregion is a very strongly contracting operation. Okay, so we, we get these very nice representations and they, uh, they are the unitary things which are on the boundary corresponding to our Lorentzian space times. But not so, because when we go to the bad parts of the Shilov boundary where PSL2R uh, uh, degenerates, then what happens? Well, if you take one of these unitary representations, you can ask what happens as the element in this non-compact group PSL2R degenerates to something of which it has rank 1. So in other words, it degenerates to a Mobius transformation which, away from this point, shoves everything to there. It sort of collapses everything down to there and creates a hole there. So in the physical picture, that's what I was calling a black hole a moment ago. And in fact, you can ask what happens to the operator, and it per you can see perfectly well exactly what happens, that it projects onto a one-dimensional space. Uh, in other words, in terms of the holomorphic picture, it's as if the cobordism had broken in two. Uh, well, that, I think that's actually rather interesting if, because in general relativity theory people are always discussing whether unitarity is preserved by when you have a black hole and that sort of thing. Uh, and w I think this is rather relevant to that. You can see a black hole as precisely 
a sort of singular, a bad point of the Shilov boundary of the complex domain. So you could imagine you had a beautifully, beautifully behaved holomorphic thing in the interior of the complex domain, and mostly on the boundary, it would, when you had a reasonable kind of space-time, it would give you a unitary propagation on the boundary. But for things like the bad sorts I talked about there, we expect all of a sudden the operator to tend to something which uh, collapses a large part of the space. Gosh. Well, I now want to turn... Uh, that I took a bit too long on that. Uh, I want to, the other thing I really do want to talk about in this talk is field operators. Uh, so I'll try and... That, that is perhaps a little bit less <laughs> confusing, at least, I hope. So I hope I can say it a bit quicker. Now, remember, in my first lecture, I said that when we had the space-time W and a point X, we defined a vector space of what I called fields at the point X by saying that this was the inverse limit of the space associated to the boundary of a little neighborhood which had X in its interior. <coughs> so that was the definition. And this is a vector space, but I pointed out that it has a kind of generalized algebra structure that when you have a finite number of points in a disk, you get some kind of multiplication which takes values in a completion of this. Well, just by way of propaganda, again, let's consider for that the case D equals 1, uh, because I think it looks, it's kind of, in elementary, so this is just elementary quantum mechanics, People are always getting themselves into a twist about the fact that all the operators anyone's ever interested in are unbounded operators and so on, and you can't really multiply them. So when you try to state the um, Stone von Neumann theorem, which is the main theorem in the subject, it's kind of a misery to do so. And that fits in... I'll say more about this in the next lecture, but you see, what? supposing we had a, theor a one-dimensional theory, well, the only one-dimensional manifolds are lines and circles. So we have an X like this. Uh, it, the only possible intervals around it are like that. We'll have the same vector space. There's only one possible point. So we just have one vector space. And the if it's, a, say, a unitary theory, we can have a point with one orientation and a point with the other corresponding to complex conjugation. So if this is the disk, uh, then H of D, H of the boundary of D, is H bar tensor H according to the axioms. And I haven't told you what kind of tensor product, but you'll see it presently doesn't matter. Um, <coughs> well, so uh, you'll see at once that it doesn't matter what kind of tensor product I put there. Now we want to take a limit as this thing gets smaller. Now, the whole thing is going to, remember, given a thing of length t, we have some propagation which has to form a semigroup of exactly this kind, which in, if t is real and Riemannian, so to speak, will be a contraction operator like that where h is a positive operator. Well, so we're looking at some, you can think of this as some kind of operator from h to h, the kernel of some kind of operator. For instance, if this were the Hilbert space tensor product, it will be a Hilbert-Schmidt operator. But we're going to take an inverse limit of these Hilbert-Schmidt operators where we come in. So we're going to take Hilbert-Schmidt operators. So let's just call, think of that as the Hilbert-Schmidt operators in H. But we are forming an inverse system where the typical map in the inverse system is taking an operator A to... Uh, a, well, composed on each side with some rapidly contracting operator. So what is the inverse limit? Well, it consists of all wildly unbounded <coughs> operators in the Hilbert space, but which have the property that they become nice when you do that to them for any positive 
T1 and T2. Well, of course, they can't be uh, composed, so that they don't form uh, an algebra, the, these very unbounded operators. But, of course, you can do exactly what I said, that if you take any two points a little bit apart, you can compose them with an e to the minus epsilon h in between, and that's what this structure is doing. And so even in one-dimensional and ordinary quantum mechanics, this is, I think, quite a good way to look at the situation you actually have. Anyway, that isn't my main point. The thing we really want to discuss is uh, to what extent does uh, this vector space, O of x, <coughs> depend on on the Riemannian neighborhood of X. Um, you see, I said take the limit over all of these disks, but you might as well remember this is a Riemannian manifold. So supposing we pick an orthonormal frame in its tangent space, then we will have the exponential map giving us standard geodesic kind of disks emanating around that point and they will form a conformal, they will form a co-final system in this inverse limit. So we might as well just take the inverse limit over that. Now if we write the metric in this Riemannian metric in those coordinates, of course you know it will be kind of the standard form dx i squared plus uh, a correction which is sort of quadratic. I never quite remember what it is. Oh, I don't know. <laughs> probably have to it's xi, xj, d, dx, k, dx, l, roughly speaking. The, the, the curvature tensor comes in as quadratic corrections to the metric. So, in principle, this depends on the metric. Now, I have the impression that, uh, well, so in, in, in the theories one can understand, like free field theories on curved space-time and so on, this actually doesn't depend on the local curvature. In principle, it could depend on the local curvature. Now, I have the impression that that's a condition like the condition which one meets in ordinary books on quantum field theory where you have asymptotic freedom. You see, supposing we were comparing the difference between a, a massive free field and, well, free fields with two different masses, for instance, We'd be looking at these spaces in the two theories associated to smaller and smaller circles, and they'd be propagating, we'd look at the different propagating in with different masses. Well, uh, clearly, as we get to very short distance, the mass is going to become irrelevant, and so the limit is going to be something that only is, uh, that doesn't see the mass, and similarly doesn't see, I hope, the curvature of space-time. But this is a condition which I would want to put on theories. I would call these regular theories or something. And as I say, it's a condition of the same kind as asymptotic freedom. That this just depends on the, let's call the theory regular or something, if the theory just depends on the Riemannian tangent space. So... <coughs> Uh, Ox just depends on Tx with its Riemannian metric. Well, in that case, what happens? That means that this thing, this space Ox, uh, first of all, it's the same at every point of um, space-time. It also, of course, as it depends, I mean, you can identify it with O of the origin in Rd the standard uh, example. And clearly then this has an action of the orthogonal group OD. But it actually has an action of the conformal orthogonal group. Because as we were taking this limit, you see, if you think about just dilatations, clearly they will act on this too, because that's just moving the inverse system in or out. So we will have actually automatically, in this regular case, an action of the conformal, I don't know what you write it, C, O, D. And uh, so let's say, think what that says. Uh, 
what that actually says. Um, so supposing we're in this situation where this just depends on the tangent space then. Uh, supposing we pick a vector psi in this thing. I'll just call it O because it's independent of the point. Then whenever we have any cobordism, and we take x, then we can put a little disk around there of some radius of psilon, and think of this as a cobordism disk from m naught disjoint union the boundary of the disk to m1. So we just make take out that little disk. And we'll get h of m naught tensor h of the boundary of the disk going to h of m1. But we can put in the psi here, and that will give us an operation which we might call psi of x, which will be something from h of m0 to h of m1. And depending on x, uh, you can see that precisely by the way the things are set up, uh, this will be, uh, well, sort of. Sorry. If, if I chose an, sorry, L let's choose a vector which is invariant under the conformal group. Uh, then this will be independent of the disk, and I'll have a well-defined operator there. So I'll have, uh, I'll have in fact, a C infinity map from the interior of this cobordism W into the homomorphisms, in fact, the trace class homomorphisms, from a, the thing at one end to the thing at the other. Uh, and so that's an operator valued thing which varies smoothly over this. And this is what you'd call a scalar field. Um, normally you'd expect that this thing which is by the axioms of the theory smooth in the interior of W, you'd expect it to have a boundary value as some kind of operator valued distribution uh, on the when you let x come to this boundary or that boundary. But uh, that's, uh, you'd have to, that, that's not automatically true from what I've said so far. Uh, well, now, but if we consider, uh, say, uh, we could think of vectors psi in here which behaved in some other way under the conformal group. For instance, they might be in a vector sub-representation, and that would give you something like a vector field, or you could imagine if a thing just scaled under the dilatations, that would give you a density kind of field. I mean, fields are not just um, fields are not just necessarily scalar fields, but have they depend on local coordinate systems, and uh, that, that corresponds to choosing vectors which behave according to different representations of that conformal group. So, uh, just to give you the two examples, because it will lead on what I want to talk about in the next lecture. Uh, just to give you an example of a field, the, the obvious field which one has in any theory is, of course, the energy momentum tensor. So, uh, what's that? You see, now, in any theory, we have an operator UW which depends on this and a Riemannian metric on it. <coughs> so that's some operator. Um, so we ask what happens if we make a small change in G. So I suppose we see, look at how that changes <coughs> for a small change in G. Well, the small change if we look at the first order change, will be something linear in the change of the Riemannian metric. So automatically it will be something that you can write as an integral over W of the change in the metric times some thing which I'll just write T for the moment, TW, 
uh, where TW TW is something which will be defined in the interior of W. Uh, well, you see, it will be a cross section. You see, because it's got to be something that we can integrate when multiplied by something like a change in the Riemannian metric, it will really be a cross section of over W of the dual of the Riemannian metric, so the tangent space to W with symmetric square, that's the dual of the Riemannian metrics at one point, tensored with the volume elements, uh, uh, tensor the homomorphisms from HM0 to HM1. And this will correspond to a field then TWX, which will be an O at X at each point, <coughs> and will correspond by that procedure. Now, so that's um, kind of one field which any theory has to have. Um, on the other hand, the ones that I want to talk about are the ones which would correspond to deforming the theory potentially. So the, I'll just tell you the general picture and then I'll, I think, I'll stop for today. Um, uh, in the I promised to talk more about path intervals, and I kind of decided more or less to give up on that as I didn't really have anything non-trivial to say. But in the usual approach to quantum field theory nowadays, one, as I mentioned in the, my first lecture, one starts with a space of fields on space-time manifold, whatever kind of fields one's talking about, and an action functional defined on that. So this was the traditional data which defined a quantum field theory. Now, I'm, what, what one motivation for trying to develop the theory this way is it's meant to give you a framework in which you can talk about, for instance, the isomorphism classes of field theory. So you can discuss whether there's a moduli space of field theories of a certain kind and whether it's finite or infinite dimensional, what its dimension is, that kind of thing, what its geometry is. Well, it's very hard to do that in the traditional way because uh, one knows, especially in two dimensions, that field theories can often be defined, the same field theory can often be defined starting from very different path integral pictures. On the other hand, in the traditional way, it's often, it seems again to be an art rather than a science to prove that two theories are the same. You calculate some things and get the same answer and that makes you think there must be some isomorphism. But it's not completely clear what the isomorphism, what, what, what you're trying to, what your concept of isomorphism is. And still less can you define a moduli space. But nevertheless, the usual picture is that if you want to make, say, an infinitesimal deformation of a theory, what you do is you make an infinitesimal deformation of this action function, or S. So you would change S to S plus change in S. And change in S, of course, being some local function of the field, will be the integral over the manifold of some function, lambda of the field and maybe its derivatives at a point. I'll sort of write it like that. You're, in other words, you add a term to the Lagrangian like this. So perhaps I'll write that uh, as f and I'll put a small parameter lambda in front of it. Or perhaps I should write the lambda. Uh, so we would expect an infinitesimal change to be made like this. 
And what would we expect then that to do to our... Supposing that is so, then when one translates that into the axioms that I was using, remember we were studying this path integral, e to minus s of phi d phi in some way, and we're going to make this change, putting s plus change in s, and then we're going to look at the first order change in this operator. So our operator u associated to w is meant to be something like this. So the change in u, or just formally, to be e to the minus s of phi, f of this, I'll just put phi sub x times lambda d lambda, right, it's probably d lambda in front, dx. <coughs> And in, in the translation, remember when I talked about the going between correlation functions and the axiom system, this would correspond to a field operator. This ought to be then something in OX, the fields at X, if this is going to make sense. So we're interested in the question, is it true that infinitesimal deformations of a theory always correspond to local fields, and if so, what kind of local fields give deformations? Is there a modulized space of theories and that kind of thing? Well, at present, there's not too much one can say about that. But at least in the two-dimensional case, in the next lecture, I'm going to talk about a little bit that you can say. Uh, and uh, I'll explain how, in order to hope to prove a theorem of that kind, you need to deal with the problem that one hasn't encoded enough locality that I mentioned in the last lecture, that uh, you'll need to, un in order to understand that, you'll need to understand how the spaces H associated to D minus one dimensional manifolds are local in the D minus one dimensional manifolds in a sense which is a bit hard to pin down. So that's what I'm going to talk about mm -hmm. next time. I think it's, uh, I think I'll stop now for today. So the theories you call regular are, mm. are the theories that, that we call conformal field theories in D dimensions? Field theories which carry an action of the conformal group, not just temporary? Uh, I don't think so, because, uh, I mean, for instance, a massive, would you think a massive free field was conformal? Scalar? Yeah. Uh, well, if I, uh, not massive, but if I, for instance, introduce a coupling to the, um, uh, to the scalar curvature of an appropriate coefficient, yeah, but I didn't do that. Well, I know. I'm just trying to get, <laughs> I'm trying to get what... what uh, no, you see, what I'm saying is that even if the theory... See, the all I was looking for is that just when you look very locally... Right. So a massive, a, a massive scalar field theory, for instance, is a relevant perturbation of a conformal theory. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yes. Right. So no, the mass of right. Yes, but, right. so, 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 but, but once we've perturbed it... <laughs> It's no longer conformal, but it would still be regular in the sense that I mean. I mean, it's more like a sort of, it's not quite the same as asymptotic freedom, because I'm not saying it's asymptotically free, but it's saying that as far as just looking at these, the operators that you can put in at a point, they don't see the curvature of the space on which you're putting them in. That, that, I mean, I, I don't know, I, I, I certainly would like more advice on quite what this, I mean, the only, even for free theories, I find it slightly hard to prove that it's really true, that that right. doesn't depend on the metric. But right. uh, I mean, you know, so the general sort of story after Wilson is that continuum quantum field theories are relevant perturbations of conformal field theories. Yes, right. right. Yes. And so it, 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 I think your notion, well, your notion of regular <coughs> is, either, is either the actual conformal field theory itself or any relevant perturbation thereof is a, is right, right, but it doesn't have to be an infinite. You, you in, see, in which case, your, your notion of regular would be a field theory in the sense of Wilson. I, I hope it is a field theory in the sense of Wilson, in the sense, but I don't want to have just an infinitesimal neighborhood of the conformal theories. I want to be able to do a genuine perturbation to get a different theory, which is not a conformal right. theory. 
but it will still be regular because um, when I look in this micro level around a point, you won't right. see. Well, what, I mean, what Wilson would say is if you give me a tangent vector to the space of theories at the conformal point, in other words, a, a, rel a direction in the space of relative perturbations, that defines a renormalization group trajectory. And it's the renormalization group trajectory which is the field theory. Yes, absolutely. So, but uh, so it well, suffices well, to give me you know, a, a tangent vector. Uh, I would like. Yeah, w w see, in physics literature that I've looked at, they only ever consider this trajectory in perturbation theory, so it's really a kind of germ <laughs> of an orbit of the renormalization group flow. Whereas I'm, I would like, if possible, to say that we can actually make an honest flow line. Right. So I, I, I would think that the different points on the renormalization trajectory were different field theories, even though they're related by the wow. renormalization group flow. They have different masses, for instance. Okay. Other questions? <coughs> okay, let's thank Graham again.